In the mid-1950s, the United States was desperate to know what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. No information had come out of the Soviet Union since the Second World War, and the US government was increasingly talking about a missile gap and the idea that the Soviet Union were technologically superior. The gathering of photographic aerial intelligence was deemed essential. Under the codename Bald Eagle, the United States Air Force began to solicit designs for an aircraft capable of the dangerous reconnaissance overflights of the Soviet Union. Now, as air defences got better, as each side began developing aircraft that could intercept bombers, that could fly up and shoot down enemy aircraft, one of the crucial things was if you're going to take good quality photographs, you need to do it at height. But in order to do that, that aircraft had to have some very, very special properties. It needed to be out of the range of Soviet air defences, particularly aircraft, so it couldn't be shot down. It needed to be able to fly over long distances. It needed to carry the right sort of equipment to take those images. And crucially, it needed to be able to come back time after time. They turned to the engineer Clarence Kelly Johnson and his team known as the Skunk Works. Just eight months after being given the contract, Skunk Works delivered the first U-2. It was effectively a high-flying powered glider that operated on the edge of space. The U-2 entered service in 1956. The aircraft had a flight ceiling of 70,000 foot, initially believed to be beyond the reach of Soviet fighters, missile and radar. The U-2 flight started precisely because we were uncertain about what was going on and we wanted to know more about it, in particular President Eisenhower. So everyone knew that the U-2 was a deliberate violation of, of international norms and everyone knew that eventually the U-2 would come a cropper, that it would be shot down, but nevertheless the need for better information than we have is so great that we went ahead with it anyway. Every flight was at risk of being perceived as an unauthorised invasion of another country's airspace. It was agreed that the overflights would be operated by the CIA rather than the military, so that in the event of being shot down, the flight was less likely to be perceived as an act of war. To complicate matters, the U-2 was not exactly a particularly easy aircraft to fly. All of the trade-offs that Kelly Johnson had to make to enable that aircraft to fly at such height and to take those images made it incredibly difficult for the pilots, even just taking off and landing, to preserve that narrow pencil-thin fuselage. It had a bicycle undercarriage. It required props under each, under each wing. It's designed to give of its best in the rarefied atmosphere of 70,000 feet close to space. And in the thicker air close to Earth, that makes it a very difficult prospect for the pilot to fly, especially as he's on oxygen, He's fully suited up, almost like an astronaut, eating food out of a tube and drinking water out of a tube. The pilots needed to be able to feel the movement of their airplane. They needed to be able to have an instinctual relationship with that aircraft. And then my last flight was flying a U-2. It's a magnificent platform. It's demanding on the pilot. And the men and women that fly the uh, U-2, uh, you're going up for uh, 10, sometimes 12 hours at a crack, and uh, you're in that same pressure suit environment. Uh, you come back in, you have to stall the airplane. It's got to come down on its rear wheel first. If the, if the nose gear touches, it'll go down a whole 10,000 foot runway and never land. Uh, but it's, a, it's an airplane out of the past. Despite the challenges involved, the U-2 supplied the US with critical information that it could not have obtained elsewhere. In four years of overflights, the U-2 completed around 30 reconnaissance missions, and approximately 90% of the US's hard intelligence data came from U-2 cameras. But the CIA were always aware of the risks. Going into this affair, we all believed that the U-2 would not be seen, and the Russians wouldn't know we were there. Uh, that fallacy lasted until the first penetration of denied territory turned out in retrospect. The U-2 was really quite invisible to American radars, but uh, Russian radars were a little different, better you might say. I can remember uh, squadrons of fighters underneath the U-2 trying to reach up and, and knock it down. Then in 1960, Francis Gary Powers set off from Pakistan at 6 a.m. He was expected to fly some 2,900 miles of Soviet airspace before arriving into Norway. But halfway into his mission, he disappeared. This is the partial pressure helmet and partial pressure suit that was worn by U-2 pilots, including Gary Powers. 
He was wearing something very much like this when on the 1st of May 1960, he was shot down by a Soviet SA-2 surface-to-air missile. It was in fact a near miss, it just needed to explode close enough to the, the, the fragile and complex U-2 to cause it to spin wildly out of control and begin to disintegrate. Powers was able, as his aircraft came down, to get out, to parachute down, and was in fact captured and taken prisoner by the Soviets. The CIA, believing Powers to be dead, claimed that the aircraft had in fact been performing a weather flight. The Soviets, meanwhile, not only had Powers alive and captured, but had the aircraft wreckage itself, along with the photographs it had been taking. The East-West Paris summit was due to take place in a matter of days. The US and USSR had been making significant progress towards a peace agreement. This event was not only embarrassing for Eisenhower and the US, it was a disastrous escalation of tensions. Khrushchev wanted Eisenhower to both apologise for the past flights over his country and to say that they wouldn't do them again. Eisenhower didn't do this. Eisenhower was still not keen on admitting that the programme existed. And so the Soviets actually pulled out of the peace conference that was to go ahead in Paris. Gary Powers was placed on trial in the Soviet Union. It was a grand occasion that was widely publicised and televised. He was sentenced to 10 years, including seven years of hard labour, but in fact served just under two after being exchanged for a Soviet spy. But in the years that followed his capture, an unwarranted feeling of mistrust of what Powers did began to take hold in the United States. So here was a man who had dedicated his life to serving in the United States. And yet there were always questions about, well, why didn't he kill himself? Why didn't he use his, his poison tip device? And this kind of followed Powers, even despite the fact that he was completely exonerated. And it's interesting to think that this, this one man who did something that is quite extraordinary, um, had to face so many questions about both his bravery and his commitment to his country. So Khrushchev abandoned the Paris summit and the possibility of an arms control or peace deal were closed down. Eisenhower left office in January 1961 and young John F. Kennedy took over. A mere three months after Kennedy's inauguration, one of the biggest incidents of his presidency took place. As he lines up with a solid endorsement for the home-brewed anti-Americanism of Fidel Castro. The United States was becoming increasingly concerned about the situation in Cuba after the nation had become communist under Fidel Castro in 1959. There were many Cuban exiles living in Florida who desperately wanted a change of government, and the US government did not want to see Cuba maintained as a communist state. And so President Eisenhower had agreed to a plan whereby Cuban refugees who had been trained and armed in the United States would launch an invasion and take back the island from Castro. Eisenhower left office, but this plan remained on the books, and President Kennedy signed it off. But he signed it off in a limited way. He didn't want the US to be too involved. The invading forces were badly outnumbered. The invasion was a failure. The Bay of Pigs was a very clear message sent to Castro and indeed to the Soviet Union. It said the United States was prepared to back an overthrow of that regime. Castro reached out to the Soviet Union for protection. On the 14th of October 1962, a U-2 brought back images that revealed what the US feared. The photos essentially revealed that in several locations in Cuba, Soviet missiles were being brought in, unloaded and made ready to launch. The camera used on the U-2 was the Hyson Model 73B, known as the B camera. It was capable of identifying objects as small as two and a half foot from a height of 60,000 feet. The photos clearly revealed that there were medium range and intermediate range ballistic nuclear missiles under construction in Cuba that had the capacity to reach San Francisco. This wasn't a new threat militarily. Soviet missiles already had the capacity to reach across the US, but the political implications of having them on their doorstep was a huge issue. So what were Kennedy's options? If he did nothing, the world would think the Soviet premier had pushed the president into a corner. All of Kennedy's Joint Chiefs of Staff believed airstrikes were the best option, but Kennedy was reluctant to take that step. A middle ground was chosen. A naval blockade of Cuba was actioned. The next 13 days were some of the most dangerous that the world had ever faced. It shall be the policy of this nation 
to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Then, on the 27th of October, something happened that brought the crisis to the brink. The first shot was fired. In conventional warfare, actions have consequences, and they're well understood. If one of your aircraft is shot down, the normal next step is to retaliate. But the problem in the situation in Cuba is that any escalation could lead, eventually, to nuclear conflict. And this, of course, became a direct problem on the 27th of October, when Major Rudolf Anderson, piloting a U-2 on a reconnaissance flight over Cuba, was shot down by a Soviet surface-to-air missile. Anderson had taken off from a base in Florida, and just a few hours into the mission, two surface-to-air missiles rocketed into the sky, one exploding near his U-2. Shrapnel pierced his flight suit and helmet, likely killing him instantly. Anderson was the first and only American casualty during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy and his advisers began to prepare for an attack on Cuba within days, unless a diplomatic resolution could be found. The US government thought the Soviets would then move on West Berlin, that the Americans would be forced to retaliate, and that very quickly a nuclear war would occur. On the other hand, this was also an opportunity to realise quite how far down the road of conflict both sides had gone. Khrushchev did not want this to precipitate a nuclear war. Kennedy certainly didn't either. Back channels that were established between the United States and the Soviet Union began to be used. A deal was reached directly between Khrushchev and Kennedy. The missiles would be removed from Cuba if the US agreed not to invade. And another provision was tacked on to the end of the agreement. The US would also take its nuclear missiles out of Turkey. This wasn't publicly acknowledged by the United States, but a few months later, those missiles that had been threatening the Soviet Union were withdrawn. The U-2 played a pivotal role in two of the most famous events of the Cold War, the shooting down of Gary Powers and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the U-2 was at the centre of these events because gathering photographic intelligence was so important. It was a fact recognised during the Second World War, it was a fact recognised by Eisenhower, and it's a fact that is still true today. And it's for that reason that the U-2 is still in service. Some people assume that because we now have satellites and drone technology, that things like the U-2 are not required. But satellites, for example, are quite predictable. It's easy to know when a satellite will be overhead. An aircraft like the U-2 can provide the sort of intelligence that is needed whenever it's needed. The U-2 has been upgraded many times with new systems, with new camera technology, but essentially the missions are the same and the aircraft is very much the same. The things that Clarence Kelly Johnson designed into that airframe to allow it to fly so high and for so long are still vital to the way it executes its missions today. And it's for that reason that aircraft like this are in service today and the requirement for aircraft like this to carry out those jobs will likely continue for many years to come. <laughs>